Um, the, the next story, I'm going to read a text. Well, Dan's actually going to read it. It's Genesis 19, but I want to give a little bit of background okay. to this text. So um, this story takes place uh, among Abraham and Sarah when they receive some visitors. And they're, um, they're holy visitors. Uh, they discover as they are entertaining these visitors that uh, one of them is God, and probably God with some angels. And, and in the Hebrew culture, it's important to know how, how important hospitality was. This wasn't just a, oh, come in for some tea and cookies. This was like an all-day or maybe an all-week deal where you, you kill the fatted calf and you put people up in, you, in your home and you, you hung out with people for a time. Um, and so Abram and Sarah are entertaining these visitors. And um, this the one who happens to be God tells Abraham that Sarah's going to become pregnant. You remember the story? She's, he's 100 years old. She's probably close to that. 90, thank you. And, uh, and she giggles about it. We aren't sure if she's laughing at God or if she's so happy and excited. Um, and that Abraham will be the father of a great nation. And then God tells Abraham that the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah are so great that God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. We aren't told what the sin is. Abraham pleads for the city in part because his nephew Lot and his family live there. And so Abraham says to God, you might remember, well, God, if there are only 50 people there who are holy and righteous, would you, uh, that was the one thing I forgot to say about turning off the phones. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, if there are only 50 righteous people, will you save the city? And God says, well, yeah, if there are 50 righteous. And then Abraham starts to wonder if maybe there are 50. And so he says, okay, okay, God, how about if there are 40? And, and then he says, maybe there aren't 40. How about 30, God? If there are 30, and, oh, maybe, what about 20? Okay, God, what if there are 10 righteous people there? Will you save Sodom and Gomorrah for 10 righteous people? And says, sure. God says, sure, I'll, I'll save the city. And ultimately the cities have to be destroyed. And so that's where we take up the story yep. here. Yep. Uh, Genesis 19. One through eight. <coughs> the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom. When Lot saw them, the visitors, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. Lot said, Please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night, and wash your feet, and then you can rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, we will spend the night in the square. But he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we might know them. Lot went out of the door to the men, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Well, first of all, let me say that there's a reason why the Bible is not taught to children. <laughs> this is like something out of a soap opera, right? Or worse. Um, and and it's, it's despicable what it says about the patriarchy of the day, right? That, uh, that some, a man's daughters could be offered to a, a violent crowd to save some men from the violent crowd. Um, well... Enough said about that. Um, but clearly, from the traditional perspective, this story is about homosexual men of Sodom 
who want to have sex with these two male visitors who Lot has taken into his home. Maybe Lot wants to have sex with them and keep them all to himself. We don't know. But the reason why God then destroys Sodom and Gomorrah is because of the homosexuals in the city. God hates homosexual behavior in biblical times. God hates such behavior now. And that's why these cities are destroyed. Um, did, did most of you catch the emphasis I put on the, on the word no each time? Um, I, I just wanted to explain that in case it, it didn't come through. Uh, quite often in scripture the word no uh, has sexual connotations. In Genesis, uh, to Adam knew Eve, and surprised, uh, Cain was born. So there's the sexual connotation there, too. And that's what it is here in, in both these incidences. Um, bring us out so that we might know them, so that we might have sex. So there's really no doubt in this story, um, as Jody presented the traditional interpretation, that that there's a desire on the part of this crowd, these, these men, to have sex with these visitors who uh, arrived at Lot's house. Um, yeah, so to get to know, they weren't exchanging emails, in case you were wondering. <laughs> it was a little more physical than that. Uh, this, is a, this is a rape story. That's what this is. This is a rape story. It is the desire on the part of uh, townspeople to humiliate two visitors who have entered the town square, or the borders of the town, who are staying with Lot. It is a story about uh, violence. It is a story surrounded by inhospitable attitudes. In, in the ancient world, and this is a little interesting bit of background that helps us understand this, when, when a conquering army took into captivity the conquered army, one of the first things uh, the men would do would uh, be to humiliate the captors, often raping them as a form of humiliation. And, and much like that was happening here in this story. Uh, you have inhospitable townspeople who desire to gain rape to men who have visited Lot. They are, I would suggest, they are heterosexual men who want to humiliate heterosexual men in violent ways. Second point I want to make about this passage, uh, about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, they are referred to in the scripture some 20 times, even several times in the New Testament, with uh, a detailed listing or commentary on their sins. In the 20 times they're mentioned, along with the list of their sins, never once uh, is it listed as a sin that there is homosexuality? Homosexuality is never mentioned. In fact, a pretty clear understanding of why Sodom and Gomorrah were eventually obliterated, lost from the map of the ancient world forever, comes from Ezekiel the prophet, the 16th chapter, the 49th verse. Now this was the sin of Sodom. She, the city of Sodom, and her daughters, meaning the inhabitants of Sodom, were arrogant, they were overfed, they were unconcerned, and they did not help the poor and the needy. Those were the sins of the city of Sodom and its partner city, Gomorrah. Not homosexuality. In hospi hospitality, violence, uh, the desire to humiliate 
The Stranger. This is a story about gang rape, uh, not consensual relationships. And you get to start us out with the tough text. Yeah, okay. Um, have you ever tried to read the book of Leviticus? <laughs> come on, come on, come on, somebody, somebody tell me you at least tried to read the book of Leviticus. Um, there are several books in the Bible that, uh, and Deuteronomy and Leviticus are two of them, that are crammed full of laws and regulations and rules. Um, Leviticus has two sort of premier passages that are often pulled out by someone probably, who, I won't even prejudice myself by saying it. Leviticus has two passages that are often used to support uh, um, anti-homosexual behavior. Two passages. We're going to read those. I'm going to read those for you now. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> You're trying to rattle me, you can't. <laughs> uh, first, Leviticus 18, 19 through 22. Uh, and I put, we put these in a little larger context. The bold portions, obviously, are the, are the verses we're going to concentrate on. But we wanted to surround them with, give you a little more context of how these two significant verses fit in with what's coming before uh, they appear to us. So here's a little bit of the background, and I'll read it from starting at the 19th verse. You shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in her menstrual un uncleanliness. You shall not have sexual relations with your kinsman and wife and defile yourself with her. You shall not give any of your offspring to sacrifice them to Moloch, who was, a, that was an ancient uh, false god, and so profane the name of your god. I am the Lord. Now verse 22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Abomination. I, I, I've never counted, but I, it, it would take a long time to count how many times the word abomination appears in the book of Leviticus. <laughs> now, the 20th chapter, beginning at 16th, or the 6th verse. If any turn to mediums and wizards, prostituting themselves to them, I, God, will set my face against them and will cut them off from the people. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I, the Lord your God, for I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes and observe them. I am the Lord. I sanctify you. All who curse father or mother shall be put to death. Having cursed father or mother, their blood is upon them. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Verse 12, if a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood is upon them. In verse 13, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. So... If I had lived in those days, I'd be dead. Uh, I cursed my mother often. <laughs> Rightly so. We did. <laughs> <laughs> many of the laws in the other Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, is they were, um, they were various kinds of laws. So there were laws about how you should worship. You might remember all those laws about how to build the tabernacle and what kinds of cloth and how many jewels and how it had to be woven and what size and all that sort of thing. So cultic rules, okay? Then there were moral rules. Think about the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not com commit adultery, etc., etc. There were legal rules, like 
you know, what was, how far could you walk on Sunday before you were actually committing a crime, right? I mean, there were, there were all these laws about breaking, rules about breaking the law. And then there were what's called the Holiness Code. And the Holiness Code was a group of rules that set the Israelites apart from the other neighboring nations. So the idea was, you know, uh, the other neighboring nations were polytheistic, for instance. Israel was a monotheistic nation. There were ways that the neighboring nations related to their many gods, and there were ways that the Israelites related to their one god. So many of the rules were about holiness. Holy, to be holy means to be set apart. So they were about how to be set apart from those other nations. Now, we set ourselves apart as well, but it's not by uh, what we eat. So, for instance, Dan's going to talk about shellfish in a minute. How many love shellfish? Yeah, right. Bible says don't eat it. It's a sin. Okay? So we set ourselves apart in other ways. So the traditional view is, see, I already started arguing for you. Yeah, you got to get your character. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. The traditional view is that this is part of the holiness code. And a man lying with another man was, was to be like the neighboring nations, and so it's not allowed. Homosexuality is a sin. It's an abomination. Follow me? Good. Yeah. I still made yeah. the argument. Good. Yeah. Hey, I grew up with holiness codes. <laughs> and they weren't from Leviticus. Did you curse your mother too? No, I would never do that. I did not curse my mother. Really? Yeah. Um, I'd like to share with you some of the holiness codes that I grew up with. Um, they were Sunday holiness codes. <laughs> I could, for example, play catch in the backyard with my brother, but we could not walk to the end of the block and play an organized game of baseball. We could do the first, but not the second. The second was an abomination. Uh, in the summer months, we could lay in the backyard and slather, uh, you know, mineral oil on us and burn until our hearts were content on Sunday afternoon, but we couldn't get in the car and drive five miles to Ottawa Beach in Holland. Yeah. To do that was an abomination. It was breaking the holiness code. In the house I grew up in, we could turn on the radio on Sunday. I could listen to WLS. That was still a rock station out of Chicago. Oh, yeah. Right? Larry Lujak. And, uh, but we could not turn on the TV at night and watch Ed Sullivan or the Smothers Brothers. That was an abomination. Um, my parents tried to teach us that Sunday was separate from Monday or Tuesday or any other day of the week. It was different. And to show other people and show ourselves that it was different, we abided by certain rules that might seem strange to other people. But I didn't particularly like them, but we didn't really question them. Um, they were holiness code. They were, they were familial laws. Um, I don't even want to talk to you about what it would mean if you dared cut the lawn on Sunday in my town. I mean, the place would, the place, the place would come out, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so these were holiness codes. Now, I look back and I think they weren't really, they weren't legal laws as much as ways to show that we lived a different lifestyle than somebody else who didn't follow those codes. And I think that's one way to look at these codes in Leviticus. Um, they were they were normative, and by that I mean they were they were conditional for a time to a specific people in a particular context 
uh, in, in a particular era of history, but they aren't, they don't have that function and weight today for people who call themselves the people of God, okay? That, that's what I think the value of the book of Leviticus. They showed us what a people tried to do to be holy and separate um, and blameless before God in a particular time, but they, that they're not universal for all places and all times. Um, let me give you some other examples of these laws. And, and here, here's what I, if I can find it in the Bible, I can say it to you. Um, no, that may seem strange that I would even have to introduce this, but if it's in the Bible, I can say it to you, okay? I'm not making this up, okay. As long as there are no children in the room. Sexual intercourse with a woman during her monthly period was considered an abomination. Yeah. All right? As Jody mentioned before, to eat shellfish, shrimp, lobster, was an abomination. Um... To sow your field, to plant two types of seed, to plant corn and wheat in the same acre, was an abomination. It was mixing of seeds. You weren't keeping them separate. To wear a garment of two different types of material was an abomination. Um, to eat meat with its blood still in it, to have a filet mignon, medium rare, <laughs> abomination. To round off the hair of your temples and not let the curls dangle down was an abomination. Um, to have a beard, but to keep it trimmed, I'm a living abomination. Okay? To have a, hey, how many people here have tattoo? Raise your hand. Tattoo. Abomination, according to Leviticus, okay? A child is disrespectful to a parent. That child should be stoned because it's disrespect is an abomination. Here's my favorite one. I said it's in the Bible, and I can say it to you, and I'm going to say it to you. It's found, I think, in Deuteronomy 23, maybe 25. One of those passages. Okay, imagine two men having a fight, getting into a, a brawl, going at it, all right? In Deuteronomy, it says, if the wife of one of the men gets involved in that fight and grabs the testicles of the opponent and squeezes them tight, her hand should be cut off. Because that's an abomination. Was that a no practice? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> the entire 15th chapter of Leviticus, that's uh, 33 verses, talks about a man's discharge of semen and a woman's discharge of blood. The, the two should never mix. It's an abomination. Okay, so what, what is all this, what is all this, please God, what does all this mean? Um, uh, I, I want to make three points about Leviticus and as it relates to the, to the two verses about a male should not lie with a male as with a woman. Um, in, in the ancient world, the world in which the Hebrew Scriptures was written, and for much of the New Testament world, it was, it was a man's world. And we, we have to acknowledge that when we, just when we open the Bible, it, it, it was a man's world. It was a patriarchal society. Uh, and that included everything from property, possession, to sexual relationships. It was a man's world. Life itself emanated from the male. The woman was merely an incubator. You know, the, the man held life in the semen. That was it. Um, and males were dominant in, in the sexual act. And a woman was the submissive receiver. So, can you imagine then, what, what is conveyed if, if two men lie together as a man would lie with a woman. One of the men has to be the dominant. 
giver. The other man has to be the submissive, woman-like receiver. A man could never put himself in the position of a woman and have any respect. It was, it was humiliating. That's one thing about this command. It, it would be humiliating for a man to take the position of a woman and lie with another man. Second thing I want to say about it, and we've kind of referred to it, this word abomination. It, you know, we think it's such a loaded word, but it, it really means that which is ritualistic, un unclean, and impure. And I think as you've seen in the examples Jody and I have given, even when Jody sort of defended the traditional view, and in the examples that I've given, you know, that which was considered <laughs> unclean, impure 3,000 years ago, um, you know, are shellfish really an abomination? Uh, <laughs> a tattoo? Um, I think we'd say, okay, for that place and time it was, but for our own, not so much. You know, the issue, the issue as Jody brought out so well, was how was Israel going, going to define its sort of cultic, its religious life, its social life, so as to be a light to the nations, to prove that they were different from the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Hittites and the Amorites and, and all these other pagan nations. And they established this, this, I call it kind of a lasagna layer of laws upon laws upon laws to sort of maintain this purity and separateness. Um, and the third thing I want to say just briefly, uh, we always have to consider when we particularly read the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, that Israel was, uh, in its history, in the early part of its history, an insignificant ragtag gathering of former slaves. And they journeyed from Egypt through the Sinai Peninsula into Canaan, and they, and they walked into a, um, uh, a geographic area composed of more sophisticated, civilized, more powerful nations than they. I mean, when the, tri uh, when the two spies came back uh, scouting out the promised land, they said, we feel like grasshoppers among giants. And how was Israel going to survive? How was this nation of former slaves going to uh, enter the promised land and maintain and, and conquer the land without populating? They had to populate. They had to grow. Um, it was the worst curse uh, in history for a, a couple not to have children and for a woman not to be able to conceive and particularly to bear a son. It was all about populating the land and um, when two men are lying together as with a man with a woman, the two men aren't going to produce children. That was an abomination. Um, that was that was um, that was as necessary as air and water to populate. And, and in the case of men lying with men, they couldn't secure the future of the nation. So those are the three important points to remember about Leviticus. You know, playing softball on Sunday. Yeah. 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 So yeah. uh, we're going to take a, yeah. a little bit of a break so you can use the restroom, have a snack. Um, are there any questions before we go? Don? Yeah, I just am curious about how you, does that mean you can pick and choose what to obey from the Bible then? Well, that's, a, that's an important question. I think we have to be, uh, well, I would say a couple things. One is I think we have to be careful, you know, that we don't just dump things out that we don't want to believe because, right? And, and the second thing is I think we need to do this work in community. I think we need to check one another and say, wait a minute, you know, do you, you know, maybe we shouldn't be eating shellfish. Maybe we shouldn't be wearing clothes that's polyester and cotton. Maybe, right? I mean, I'm not trying to be silly. I'm mm -hmm. saying really we should be, we should be together in this, uh, in this task of interpretation. <coughs> Oh, I'll say another thing. It's all interpretation. I mean, Dan and I stand here, but between us there are 
a million other people with their own perceptions on these verses and beyond us on the continuum. So it's all interpretation. Um, and I think there are larger principles that we have to pay attention to. I'm on point four now, I think. So, so for instance, how Dan started by talking about this, this Bible about justice and poverty. You know, we, we um, if we're going to pick and choose, let's at least pick the texts or the themes that are the most prevalent, that are the most available, that are the most accessible. I mean, the reason the Bible talks about poverty so much is because it's an important topic in terms of who God was to the people who wrote the Bible. So that's what we ought to be really taking measure of, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, do you want to say anything else in regard to that, how we interpret? Um, <coughs> other than to say we do pick and choose. Um, I should have started there. <laughs> I'm not going to deny that. Uh, we do pick and choose. And, and hopefully in light of, of the tradition of the church, and hopefully in light of the, the conversation of, of the body of Christ, uh, we do pick and choose. Um, it, it seems to me there are, there are levels of, I mean, when I look at the Ten Commandments, for example, if I can describe the Ten Commandments as an umbrella, uh, which, which covers us, or maybe a foundation which sustains us. Um, with the command, thou shalt not kill. How can you have a commandment that says, thou shalt not kill? And then, um, in the same book of the Bible, it says, you know, if your smart-ass little son uh, gives you a lot of lip, you should kill him. And how does that jive? And, and we got to pick and choose. Um, Weren't the books of the Bible? And chosen from oh, yeah. Yeah. That might be a whole interesting yeah. course. Yeah. You know, we, we, yeah. we think that's such a holy endeavor, how, how the Bible was kind of gathered together, but it was filled with political intrigue, and, and some of it was anything but holy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Doug. Uh, Dan, uh, where did your parents learn to set apart Sundays? Where did they? From church? From their parents. But was it from church as well? Oh, yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. 